Welcome to another Advent of Code walkthrough video. Today we'll be looking at 2022 Day 18. So, we finally reached fresh air, and we've emerged near the base of the volcano. Fortunately, the lava seems to be flowing away. But there are bits of lava still being ejected at us, so we're hiding in a cave for a bit longer. Outside the cave, you can see lava landing in a pond, and hearing it loudly hiss as it solidifies. Depending on what's in the lava and how fast it cools, it might be forming obsidian which is a special type of glass, which is formed from rapidly cooling lava. Um, and it has minimal crystal growth. So basically, um, sometimes depending on the composition of the lava, it can like, for example, come in contact with water and cool down really rapidly. And with minimum crystal growth, it forms into just one amorphous piece of glass. Um, it's really hard, but also really brittle. So you can fracture it into very sharp edges and it actually forms pretty good blades because of how sharply it can fracture. Um, however, it really hasn't seen much mainstream usage for that purpose. The cooling rate should be based on the surface area, so we take a quick scan of the droplet as it flies past us. Because of how quickly it's moving, the scan isn't very good, so it's a very low res approximation with 1x1x1 one by one by one cubes on a 3D grid. So 3D grids are a bit scary initially, but they're honestly not too hard to deal with. The one unfortunate thing is that we won't be able to use complex numbers because they only have two axes, so we're going to have to just represent these as actual tuples themselves. So for example, if we have two adjacent cubes, 1, 1, 1, and 2, 1, 1, then each cube has six sides, but because they're adjacent, then two of these sides are joined, so there are only ten exposed sides. So our approach for this problem is essentially going to be as such. For each subcube, we will add all six of its faces into our set. And then we will just remove duplicates at the end. So here's our larger test example, which has a surface area of 64. And here's our actual input. OK, so we're going to store the faces as a dictionary, mapping each face to the number of times it occurs. If a face occurs two times, then that means that two cubes are, like both of its uh, faces are present. It's also impossible for a face to appear more than two times, for obvious reasons. So how will we represent a face? Well, we'll just represent it as um, halfway between the two cubes on its left and its right. And that way, the looking at the face from one cube towards another is the same as looking at the face from that cube to this one. Um, on the actual contest, I stored it as a tuple, as a pair of the two cubes that the face joins, um, and then just sorted it so that it would be the same regardless of which side you look at it from. But that's less convenient, and I probably should have thought of the halfway method instead. Okay. So for each input, for line in, in uh, open 0, we will do x, y, z equals map int line dot split on commas. So x, y, z will give us all of our tuples. And now we can just do for dx, dy, dz in, and then we'll list out all of our faces, uh, sorry, our offsets. So let's put that into a list, just so we don't crowd our loop. The offsets are going to be 0, 0, 0 0.5, because of the halfway thing, 0, 0, 0.50, 0, and 0, 0.500. 0, 0. So these are the three faces in the positive x, y, and z directions. And then we also have the faces on the opposite side. So 0, 0, negative 0 0.5, 0, negative 0.50, 0, and 0, uh, sorry, negative 0 0.5, 0, 0. So for each of these offsets, we will add it into the face. So J will, uh, K for key, K will be the face's ID, basically. And this is unique per face. We'll just add X, Y, Z to DX, D, Y, D, Z. Like so. And now we can just do if K is not in faces, faces faces k equals 0, and then faces k plus equals 1. So now we have a dictionary mapping the number of uh, each face to the number of times it occurs. And so now we just need to take the values and count the number of times 1 shows up. And so that gives us our 
test output of 64 and our puzzle output of 43, uh, 45.36. You know, the funny thing about this is actually this solution is, it took me less time to write this out, even with my commentary, than it took me to write out my solution that I did live. I only got 37th on first place today. If I just went with this directly, I honestly might have done better. Um, the way I did it was honestly kind of dumb. Moving on to part two. Let me just save my code first to upload later. Moving on to part two. Something seems off about the calculation. The cooling rate depends on external surface area, but our calculation also included the surface area of trapped air pockets. Instead, only consider the sides of cubes that could be reached by the water and the steam as the lava droplet tumbles into the pond. The steam will expand to reach as much as possible, completely displacing any air on the outside of the lava droplet, but never expanding diagonally. So in other words, we are basically pathfinding for all faces that can be visited from the outside of the lava droplet, and we are ignoring anything that is trapped. And something is trapped if it is cut off by its faces, we will not go through edges or through corners. So what that means is if we imagine a situation in which we have a cube at the top, a cube on the right, a cube behind, you know, the funny thing is, this would actually be easier to visualize if I had Minecraft open right now. A cube underneath, and then a cube behind and a cube in front. This bit would be trapped even though it's open to the edge, and it's also open through the corners. But we are only considering faces. So what we're going to do is, instead of pathfinding for faces, because that's a bit tricky to reason with, we'll just pathfind for all open air spots, and then we'll filter our faces to only include ones where one of the cube edges is adjacent to an open space. So how we're going to do this is, we're going to, how do we exactly define the outside? Well, we can create a bounding box around the droplet, and then just expand it out by a bit, and then start at the bottom left corner, and that's guaranteed to be outside of our droplet. So we will keep track of mx for min, uh, min x, min y, and min z, as, uh, which will start out at infinity, and max x, max y, and max z, which will start out at negative infinity. Each time we see an x, y value, we'll just update our maximum, so mx equals min mx and x, and then we just Oh god, that's not what I meant to do. And then just update this for all three coordinates, and then we'll also do the same for this, but with max. Also not what I meant to do. Okay. I'm sure there's a smarter way to do this, but there we go. So now we have a bounding box around the droplet. And just to make sure that we, um, we need to ensure two things. First of all, we need to make sure we don't accidentally start inside the droplet. And second of all, we need to make sure we cover all the airspace around the other side as well. So we'll expand our bounding box by one, by decreasing all of the minimums by one, and then increasing all of the maximums by one. And now what we'll do is basically just breadth first fill. Um, I think depth first works fine as well. Either way, it's the same thing. So we'll also need to keep track of which cells are in the uh, droplet. So we'll call that droplet equals set. And each time we'll just droplet dot add uh, cell, like so. And so if we print out what the droplet is, Uh, that's what we get. It's just the list of, let me run this on the test input. This is just the input list, essentially. It just tells us where all of the lava blobs are, uh, because we can't pathfind through them. So now we'll keep track of all of the air spaces, and we'll keep a Q
of available of cells, which will start out at just the lower corner of the bounding box, MX, uh, min x, y, z, and air will start out equal to that as well. And now we just do our pathfinding, which is a very standard path first. Fill while Q, X, Y, Z equals Q dot pop left. Um, for DX, DY, DZ in offsets, because remember, we put it in a separate variable, so now we can just reuse it here. Um, NX equal NX and Y and Z equals K equals X plus DX, Y plus DY, Z plus DZ. Why is my formatter not working? Okay. And now we just need to do a couple of checks. So firstly, if it goes outside the bounding box, we want to stop, otherwise we'd never finish. So if not mx less than or equal to nx less than or equal to mx, and so if any of the coordinates are out of our bounding box, then they're irrelevant to us because we only need to consider one layer of air around the droplet. Then continue. And if it's already in either droplet or in air, we can continue. If it's in droplet, we need to skip it so that we don't pathfind through the droplet. And if it's in air, then we can skip it because we've already visited it. So otherwise, when we reach this point, we can just do air.add k and q dot append k. So now if we print out air, this will be a set of all spaces that are free. Um, that actually is not correct, sorry. I forgot that offsets is um, the halved versions. So I think we'll need to multiply all of these by two because we're jumping between cells, basically. Okay, so now that this has all of the uh, cells that are considered air, so basically all of the external cells, we now just need to convert each one to a set of faces. So available faces, which I'll call free, uh, I'll just do four x, y, z in air, four dx, dy, dz in offsets, free dot, dot add, x plus dx, y plus dy, z plus dz. So basically we're taking all of the free air cells, calculating all six of the faces for each one, and then compiling them all into a set. And so now all we need to do is take, um, we just keep a total for each, uh, for each key in faces. If faces, if key is in free and faces key equals one, then total plus equals one. So what we're basically saying now is for each of the faces that we calculated the droplet has, if one of these, uh, if the face is one of the faces that was adjacent to an exterior air cell, in other words, if it's not trapped, and this face, this check is actually unnecessary, um, then total plus equals one. And finally, we just print total. And so this gives us 58 for our test output and 2,606 for our actual output. We could also shorten this a bit by just doing print length of set faces and free. Basically, take the faces that we calculated, take the set of all of them, and then take the intersection with the free faces. And the reason the equals one check isn't needed anymore is because all faces that have a occurrence count of two are between two droplet cells. And so since neither of those are uh, air cells, then that face will not be in the free set. So this, you can see, gives us the same answer. So honestly, I am pleasantly surprised by today's problem not being too challenging, considering it's a weak end and the relatively uh, high difficulty of the past few problems. I was completely expecting today's to be a lot more difficult. Honestly, I was kind of caught a bit off guard by how simple it was. Um, 
Of course, that kind of sounds like an excuse for my poor performance today. But that aside, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something, and I'll see you tomorrow for day 19.